Michael Brown here, today joined by Bonnie Lahota, an independent artist from Boulder, Colorado. Bonnie is a pioneer in digital lenticular printmaking, having, having started in the late 90s. So with that, welcome, Bonnie. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, well, you're so welcome. I have a, a list of questions to ask you today, Bonnie. And I guess the first way I'd like to start out is saying, uh, what did you major in in college? You know, what's your background? Um, I got a fine arts degree and, uh, I even recently asked my mom, uh, that I said, mom, how could you have allowed me to do that? And she just smiled and I had never should have done. But in addition to the fine arts background, I took a lot of law classes and I took a lot of business classes because I realized that as an artist that you, you couldn't stand at an easel and expect somebody to hire you to do a job. And, so, uh, so true. I mean, most artists don't have that business component and and they struggle yeah. because of that. Now, what what made you become interested in lenticulars? There must have been some spark that made you get curious about this topic. Yeah, well, when I was a kid, I was fascinated with the lenticulars that were in the Cracker Jacks. And then, uh, and I ate a lot of Cracker Jacks back then, and my mom always laughed and pulled them out, and it was a fun thing to get that in the box. Uh, and then in the 50s, when Eisenhower was elected, uh, I ran across, I, you know, my mom gave me this, the lenticular flip button, and I've kept that all these years. And then uh, I somehow in 99 learned about the flip software. And I thought, gee, that might be fun because there was talk that we would be able to make these ourselves with inkjet printers. And so I kind of beat down that path, as I always do with new technology, uh, along with my two associates, Karen Schmanke and Dorothy Krauss. We formed this group called Digital Atelier. And I always came up with these bright ideas. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And we would scatter and get information and come back together and do the work. And the lenticular was the first thing that we did that way. Uh, we went to a place in California and learned the flip software, uh, which is also where I met or didn't meet, but learned about uh, Thomas Marks and Ken Connolly. And I got in touch with Thomas and he gave, he gave me the software. Then Dorothy, Karen, and I set up what really was a groundbreaking event back then. We had a virtual workshop. Oh, wow. Dorothy was in Boston Karen's in Seattle and I'm in Denver. And we even have a PDF we made that says virtual workshop on it back in 98. Amazing. And that's how we learned it. We were, I remember being on the phone all day long on a conference call constantly with them as we worked through developing a process that worked for fine art. And so that, that was really the beginning of my interest in it. Uh, I then uh, got uh, more uh, interested in learning about the different lenses, uh, ended up meeting with or meeting or talking to Ken Connolly, who was uh, making the lenses. So he gave us lens so that we could do this. And at the same time, Epson was coming out with a brand new inkjet printer uh, that was really great in color, high resolution. So we kind of put all those ideas together and said, well, you know, we think we could do this uh, lenticular inkjet. And so Ken gave us the lens and Epson gave us their uh, inkjet printers because we had already established a relationship with Epson uh, when we did an event at the Smithsonian. And so I made that first lenticular, which was a clock and using the flip software. And that even today has an amazing amount of beautiful depth, animation and clarity on a 40 line lens that is phenomenal. And that inkjet printer wasn't as high resolution or perfect as the ones that we have today. And once I did that first one, I thought, okay, this is art. Now I can, I can move forward and do something really great with it. Well, what's interesting is if someone wanted to learn today, there's the internet, 
there's forums, there's mentors, there's a lot of commercial software. But in the late 90s, there's really, not- there's none of that. So, so I, I can imagine, you know, the three of you on the phone talking to one another, but without that visual feedback component, it would be far more difficult. So I think really you probably developed, you know, a lot of the techniques that those of us doing lenticular today you know, are taking advantage of your, your, your pioneering efforts. Well, what we had to, we had to do it in our heads. And, and today, everything, a lot of the programs, it's done in the computer. And I can't quite follow what those fancy softwares are doing. I would still be much more comfortable with the flip software or 3D Genius to do my work where I have full control in my mind and what's on screen is very minimal as far as control goes. Now, some of your early pieces, I remember seeing at a Sabled conference in San Francisco 20 plus years ago, and that was mind blowing for me because again, all these technologies were just coming out, as you said, the high quality inkjet printers, um, a source of lenticular lenses. I mean, what Ken Connolly did was kind of extraordinary. So you, you took these various things, software, lenses, hardware, and brought all together and then had this amazing exhibition. And I thought it'd be interesting to learn a little bit about that. Well, that exposition was called time exposure. And we used time and clocks as the basis for the imagery. But we also felt that we needed to get wider format printers to do the lenticular. So I approached Roland, who was making inkjet printers at the time, and asked them if they would loan us their printers so that we could have this exhibit. And we also developed a relationship with the Seabolt folks that because they became became known that we really forged into a lot of areas that hadn't been exposed before. And they would give us a booth at many of the Seabolt conventions to do some project. And we presented this as a project and they grabbed it right away and said, yes. And they said, how big a booth do you need? And I said, well, I need like three booths, really long, big exhibit. You saw it. It was huge. Uh, and they just thought for a minute, they said, okay. <laughs> so we had nice. this enormous exhibition and it were people swarmed into that booth. You're right. It was the first time it had ever been shown like that. And lots of questions. Uh, Ken Connolly was there and probably as I remember it, one of the most exciting conventions that we did and from there, we took that show immediately to the Boston Seabolt because it was shortly thereafter. And we uh, displayed it there. And to my surprise, the reception there was so enormous that I sold $14,000 worth of lenticulars at that exhibition. Wow. And it never happened again, but it... it was enough of a boost that I thought, okay, I'm going to stick with this and do some really cool stuff. What happened then is I just, I had these relationships with a lot of art consultants and they would let me go make a presentation with them at a client. And a good example of that is the one that's in my background here. These are all parts of a Mac store hard drive. And they had built a new facility here in Denver and the uh, art consultant took me in and I sat down. I said, this is what I can do. Now, honestly, the only thing I did make a mistake doing was say, could I have some broken hard drives to take apart? <laughs> and of course, no hard drive company is going to say they've got broken hard drives. Uh, and they, they laughed and uh, they didn't have any. So I bought one and took it apart, took all the photographs and developed this 3D animation series that it was lined down their long, long hallway to the production area. And there's animation, there's changes of color, there's depth. There was a lot of activity in the pieces with great clarity that really spoke to their company and what they did. And that is the key to how how big Uh, those were about 36 inches square. Wow. Big. Yeah, they were good size ones. Um, I had a coda laminator, so I, you know, I could do 42 inch, 44 inch wide laminations myself. Uh, I'd climb up on a 16 foot ladder with a long hammer on the end of a stick 
you know, to tap the thing into the alignment bars. Very, very low tech. Uh, I no can't light believe tape. that worked. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you know, from, from the top of the ladder, looking down, and you know, with, with a hammer and tapping it this way and that way, that worked. But the uh, whole idea that I have when I work with uh, selling my work in a corporation or you know to a company is how can I best display what they do and read you know do something that really enhances their environment, talks about their business and their background. And the job I did for uh, Maxtor was like that. Uh, lots of fun to do. And I, I did a lot of pieces that way. It might be fun to uh, just talk about some of the other pieces you've done. And I, and I know you've done a multitude of pieces, but maybe we could just go through, uh, you know, three or four pieces and hear the stories behind them. Sure. You had m- mentioned, I thought, something about a, a TEDx bear. Oh, yes. One of the very first uh, pieces that I did early on before the uh, Seabolt Convention was this uh, Ted Bear. And in 98, 99, everybody wanted to do lenticular. And I got a call from TEDx and they said they had Tektronix, which is a laser printer as one of their sponsors. And would I do a 3D lenticular for 400 people for the conference? And I said, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> Not realizing what that acceptance really meant. Uh, and, and I used a 40 line lens and hand laminated 400 pieces in about two and a half weeks. And they, sh- I don't know who it was that shipped me the bear, but it was a very precious bear. And I would be called nearly daily to have someone check on the bear. Wow. <laughs> it was sent to me FedEx overnight, darn near white glove service. And when it went back, it went back, you know, top level FedEx service back to uh, Monterey, California. Wow. And so, so I got that, a question. I, I generally don't think of laser printers being used for no. lenticular printmaking. So did were there any technical issues? No. Tektronic la- color laser printers are fabulous. The resolution was photographic, as good as any inkjet printer at the time that was on the market. And I wouldn't hesitate to do a small one on their equipment again today. And what media did you print on? Uh, I printed on their, uh, they had a, they had a paper that was like a really hard, smooth, glossy surface that was meant for really high quality laser prints. Okay. And so I used their media and their printer and it was extraordinary the way they looked. Well, you wowed me. I never would have guessed no. that would work and I wouldn't recommend that path, but obviously there's something to be explored there. Today you'd say, no, they can't be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't go down that road. Um, now, what about the Natural History Museum? I hear. Oh, that, yes. I was commissioned to do a piece for a hospital here in Denver for their lobby. And they wanted this beautiful um, prairie garden 3D piece for, in the lobby. And then one of the pieces adjacent to it was to be a bald eagle. And I, and I said, yeah, I could do a bald eagle. And I had no idea where I'd get one. But I called up the Natural History Museum and told them what the project was for and said, is there any chance I could borrow one? And so they let me come down there and go into their bird archives in the back, down in the basement and pick out what I wanted. And so I carried him out, put him in the car, strapped him into the seatbelt and drove back to Boulder from Denver. And everybody I passed, all the construction people on the highway and everything, I mean, they just dropped their shovels and said, you know, what is that we're seeing? Uh, So it was a very fun trip back from the museum and another fun trip returning that uh, later on. And so, yeah, so you could borrow things like that from the Natural History Museum. That amazes me. You must be very persuasive to to let them. Well, you know... (laughs) Early on in this lenticular business, and even this was really early inkjet too, we had a way of approaching people, and I don't know whether it's a natural way I have or what, but you say, you know, this is what I'd like to do, and this is what this project would do for you. 
And that wasn't always about me or never was about me or making money. It was about exploring something new, which is what I've always done is look for new products, new equipment, new ways to look at things. Uh, And I've gotten access uh, very generously to many, many things in the industry. Nice. Nice. And now doing time, I think that was one of your first pieces, right? Yes, that was a piece I did using the flip software. And again, that flip software, I, any school that starts out, they ought to use that software. It's fantastic. But I did that for on the Roland printer, and it was entered in a competition at uh, one of their SGIA conferences in Dallas uh, at a convention center. And it won uh, a big prize for Roland because of the quality of their printer was so terrific. And uh, after it was entered, uh, magically, somebody stole it. Oh, jeez. And it's the only piece of artwork in my whole career that has ever been stolen. And I hope the person that has it is enjoying it. Uh, I feel badly about having that stolen. But, you know, somebody, somebody was so taken and enthralled. Maybe it's okay. I don't know. I think they should be doing time for that. Yes, they should be doing time. <laughs> you know, I, and I didn't even report it to the police or anybody. And I just, but as a result of that, every year after that, uh, the conference has security, roped off security in their exhibition areas. Oh, good. They should anyway. All, all the expensive equipment. equipment this there. is just the art exhibit. Oh, in the art. I got they, you. Have, they have security in the art exhibit now. Because nice. of the piece that I was still had stolen. So it seems to me that you prefer 3D lenticulars over flip type lenticulars. Is that true or not? Yes, I do, because I like the illusion of depth. Uh, one of the things that I got fascinated with was a product called Aerogel that I had seen at a aerospace museum in Los Angeles. And the Aerogel is the lightest solid on the planet. Uh, it's used for insulation, but when you have a piece of it, and you if you could have it in your hand, it would be like holding a cloud. Hmm. And it, when I saw it, I thought I would buy some, came home, and then realized the thing was like $23,000 an ounce or a pound. So I knew I couldn't have it, but I thought about lenticular. Now, how with lenticular could I emulate that experience of seeing the aerogel which brings me to how you present a lenticular is not flat, like the pieces in back of me are just flat. I moved to putting things in deep, four inch deep boxes so that everything lived as a vapor in front of the lens. And it gave that real cloud like experience. And that is what people enjoy. They love the animation, they love 3D if it's in a flat lens, but Boy, the minute you put it in a box, it's a whole different experience. Um, I did one that was a fish and sent that to uh, my son when they had uh, their first child. And he toddled up to it when he was about a year old. And he put his hand through to touch the fish. And he jumped back and he says, oh, that tickles. (laughs) And when when I heard that story that he did that, I thought, that's how you present lenticular is you put it in a box. So I had an exhibition at a gallery and uh, did a sunflower. I've done a box of water. Uh, The water is really fun because it looks like it ought to fall off the wall. And so I got it very much involved in doing that 3D illusion in my work. And you like like the negative parallax where it floats off the surface as opposed to- Everything to the front everything. Wow. And that is what sold. The animations are interesting, but people right away think of the trinkets in a Cracker Jack box. But when you put it in a box that projects entirely four inches in front of the lens, it's a hundred percent different art form. And that's what sells. I had another one that was uh, a snowy tree in our backyard and it's in a white box four and a half inches deep and the tree and the snow all come out into the room. And then as a real eye trick, I put a a small glass and a pussy willow twig in front of the lens in the environment of the projected lenticular image. 
And that took the whole thing to another level. Introducing a real object into that vapor really confuses people when they look at it. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. So do you, is the depth of the lenticular piece limited to that four inches? And At then least the four. Pussy yeah. willow is in front of that. So it's, it's in it. It's in it. It's right in up against the lens. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's... And then, then the other thing I used to do is I would build a diorama because I didn't like just taking pictures of stuff everybody knows. And I I would build uh, like a, a whole bunch of blocks and letters did a piece for the Boston Book Builders. Another one I did specifically for micro lens, uh, 20 line extreme 3D lens, which was a very short run. Uh, when I heard about it, I bought a whole bunch of it. I've got cartons still in my studio and it is immersive beyond belief. Um, and I don't think that you have used that yet. <laughs> I have not. Uh, and in fact, I know a lot of lenticular artists, because they no longer make that lens, that would be very jealous and envious of your supply. Well, I, I have about 15 <laughs> pieces sitting in my studio. And I, I when this came up, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to use that stuff up. Because <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. That, it's yeah, absolutely I, beautiful. I agree. Use it. Make some great art. Um, you and I both know a fellow named Russell Brown from well, Adobe. And I yes. had a chance actually to work with you in your studio years ago at the Atom Conference. And I think that's an interesting story to share. Uh, yes. And, and it actually came about because uh, I think it was in 2008 that Russell, I got a call from this gentleman. And he says, well, I'm Russell Brown from Adobe. And I want to get into lenticular. And people tell me that you know a lot about it. And what can you tell me? And I said, well, let me get back with you, Russell, because I got to, you know, I'm doing something. And I had no idea who he was. And I called my friend, Jack DeGann. I said, who is this guy? You know, is he real? And Jack says, you don't know who Russell Brown is? I said, no. So he goes and he explains who Russell is. And I thought, I called Russell right back. And I said, yes, I, I know how to do lenticular. I'd be happy to, you know, be participate. And that was the beginning of my whole experience and continued involvement with things that Russell does for his conferences. Uh, absolutely one of the great experiences in my life is you know, working with him, as you well know, because shortly after he contacted you to do uh, the Adam Conference here in Boulder, I think in 2015, was it? Somewhere back somewhere, there. Yeah, somewhere back, back there, early days. And you came with your camera and a chair and you twirled people around and you did things that I thought, what is he doing? And I kept going back there and thinking, I didn't understand any of it. And, but what you did was just bone chilling. Uh, I, when I walked by that in display after they were all laminated, and of course you came to my studio to do the mm -hmm. printing and the laminating. But when that display went up, I thought I haven't touched this technology compared to what you were doing and you continue to do. But what's really cool about that is that an individual artist who approaches this technology really brings a new vision to it. And I think, you know, you're outstanding in what you did. I think not, I can't claim that for myself, but I've approached it completely different uh, because I'm working with, corporate clients and custom work for installations, not for mass production. I'm doing, you know, art one-off pieces. So it's, it, you know, it, it's great. And I, you know, what you did there was like, I couldn't believe it. Well, you know, I think everyone brings their own aesthetic to lenticular. So if you look at the pieces I did, you can tell photographic background. You know, in some ways, they're portraiture with a camera. When I look at the work behind you right now, the Maxter work, I see, even though they're photographic elements, I see something completely different, a bold use of color, layering techniques. Um, so you brought your own aesthetic to lenticular, and I think everyone does. What I have found now in my current work is that even though I'm not doing lenticular, I realize that 
it was a, what I'm doing is very much affected by that dimensionality because I'm layering with UV inks. I'm printing on multiple levels of surfaces. I'm creating an illusion of, of animation. Uh, I had an exhibit at uh, the gallery that I watched a curator walk a back and forth to get my work all the time. And I'm looking at him and I'm saying, what is it that he's seeing? And I, I did the same thing. And I said, oh, it's moving. It looks like it's animated and they're trying to figure it out. And now a very current group of work is um, a flowers that are counting time. Uh, the title of the exhibit is called Translucent Reality. And it's based on the memories of childhood uh, winding music boxes. And again, connected to the lenticular, you know, flips in a Cracker Jack box. So that little music box and then the frames of the lenticular, I didn't know it at the time that I was repeating to build these images as little music boxes. It's based on lenticular. Huh. And they're printed on a UV printer with 15 to 20 layers of ink. So they have a very physical depth. You could go up and feel it. People, again, want to go up and put their hand into my work or on my work. And I thought that just recently realized that that's because of the lenticular. It's so a fascination with dimension. A piece that just stands out in my mind, and I know you have a whole body of work, are the florals that have an offset to them. Those are, yeah, just like the, len, the, the frames when I made the very first clock piece, very first lenticular, where in Photoshop, I just moved the element over, you know, 30 times to create the 3D. And these pieces have that same image moved over 10 clicks, you know, 20 or 30 times to create the dimension in those pieces. And when I, when I look at those, I can't stop looking at them. There's something about the repetition. Yeah. yeah that, well, they also it's have, wild. Yeah, they have. They're, it's a repetition. Okay, there's 12 of them. And they're labeled by the months of the year. And the repetition of the days are identical. And I thought, you know, what's coming through here is this is our lockdown. This is the repetition of days, not having any change over and over and over and over again. And, you know, so things come into the work that you're really not aware of until you, you know, it's all framed and I'm sitting there and I said, well, why did I do these this way? And it's because of the repetition of 2020. But uh, my lockdown experience is not as beautiful as your artwork. <laughs> <laughs> you really, you took those to a whole new level. They're incredible. Uh, well, it's, you know, it, I, I don't realize at the time how, life interferes or makes itself visible in my work and the things I experience and the things that go on in my life and the people I meet. Uh, my work has changed dramatically uh, just from having known the folks at Adobe and the things I've gotten to do with them. Uh, you know, I've admitted a lot of processes, uh, had access to materials and equipment that other people don't get access to. And then I have written three books that uh, share and give back because you know it's process it's not how I'm not telling someone how to make their art but I'm telling them these are the tools take them and find your own way and create your own work with based on my discoveries yeah that's great well even as we touched on before you can have the technique or technology but the artist has to bring their own vision to it right. so your books will give them a jump start on how to do different digital printmaking techniques, and then they'll have to apply their vision to that. Well, and not to forget to mention that on the second book, The Last Layer, that lovely portrait on the cover is in fact Russell Brown. <laughs> <laughs> As I recall, it looks like he's in, I don't know, an astronaut helmet, it, it, a fish tank. Yes. What, what is that? <laughs> it was from one of his, uh, in very creative conferences that we attended and everybody was in costume. And uh, when I was writing the book, I, we had done an event at the uh, EG conference, I believe it was in Monterey and uh, everybody was dressing up and having their portrait taken. And then we printed them 
and transferred them to aged metal that it, through the process that I developed to create well, like a tin type look. I think lenticular imagery sells when it connects to the heart of somebody mm-hmm. in some way that they feel like they're entering another reality or another space. Uh, you know, that's why the, the Mac store ones worked is because that hardware was in their heart. It was who they were and what they are. And so that had a lot of meaning to them. So that's important in creating work for a company. Oh, I agree. People always want work that touches them personally yeah. in some way. And everyone, it's a different way. It's a d- different subject or experience. All right. Well, Bonnie, I want to thank you so much for taking part in this Zoom video conversation. I find what you've done with Lenticular fascinating. I find your art incredible, and I'm glad you're able to carve out a little time in your schedule to speak with me. Well, thank you. And thank you especially for doing this, because I think it's important to have all of this documented. And I know it's a lot of work, but it's, it's a great project. And thank you very much for including me in it.